In fact, over the years, Rakhine Buddhists felt that they have been bypassed by international communities that have provided assistance by Rohingyas, although both Buddhists and Rohingyas were equally poor. Even for populations inside the country who did not have strong positions uh, in regard to the situations, they became very angry and they became defensive of their government, of what they describe as hostile actions by international community, particularly those that they think is critical of uh, Aung San Suu Kyi. So you have a situation here where international community do not think the government has done enough to protect the rights of Rohingyas, but local populations uh, do not think that the government has done enough to safeguard the security and welfare of Myanmar citizens. So this is a very, very divided issue. So the questions that need to ask here is that why are they so fearful of this particular populations? And are those fear um, exaggerated? Are they overreacting? So I, I will highlight a number of uh, reasons why um, that explains the fear that underlying uh, local populations in Myanmar, and I'll talk about how different scholars have on Myanmar has responded to the situations. So first of all, local narratives about Rakhine populations is filled with concerns about their sheer number, which is closely associated with their perceived polygamous practices and high birth rates. Rakhine Buddhists increasingly felt like they have become minority in the region, and their fear should not be easily dismissed. So here I gave you example of this, uh, or some data. Popu- according to the British census, um, the Chattagonians uh, from the uh, from British India in- Empire uh, constitute 20,000 in 1842, and now in 2010 there there are about one million populations and another one million seeking asylum overseas. According to Nikki Asian Review, there are currently 300,000 in Pakistan, uh, 300,000 Rohingyas in Pakistan, 250,000 in Saudi Arabia, 100,000 in Malaysia, and Bangladesh also already had 400,000 since 1990. So you look at nearby Chain State, which is next to Rakhine State, they only have less than half a million of populations. So these data, right, that are floating around highlight the concerns expressed not just by Rakhine and Buddhist populations, but also minority uh, populations and uh, Christian populations in the country. The second reason, exposure to international news about violence committed by extremist terrorists affirm Buddhist distrust and hostility against the other group. Third reason, cultural and religious differences also play a big role here. Rohingyas are one of the most discriminated people in Myanmar, not because of their religion, but also people from Southeast Asia, South Asia were tended to look down upon historically as inferior uh, by the the host populations because of the past history as having performed socially inferior op- occupations, their immigration, immigrant status, and because of their darker skin color. In addition to that, there has not been very, uh, there has not been a lot of um, cultural exchange and intermarriage between these two groups. Rakhine Buddhists also felt uncomfortable about Muslims' unwillingness uh, to assimilate into local populations by adhering strictly to their food, dress, and cultural practices. And finally, security issues. Historically, as I have already mentioned, there were separatist movements by Rohingya against Burmese government to reunite what previously uh, was uh, Pakistan and which is now uh, Bangladesh. Uh, Mujahid um, rebellion was... Um, was defeated in 1961. However, throughout the military rule, there were a number of armed resistant organizations led by Rohingya leaders, and these organizations were alleged to have been um, associated with extremist Islamic parties and right-wing movements in Bangladesh, and alleged to have been in connections with Al-Qaeda. And the attacks by ARSA, 
in 2016 and 2017 further provide the rationale and exacerbate this feeling of uh, anxiety by the Buddhist populations and by the military to take more extreme measures against the group. Um, they're also afraid that according to the current constitutions, if the group, minority group is recognized as a national, um, group, a national minority group, they will be eligible to claim self-autonomous regions if they constitute more than half of the populations in two adjacent areas. And um, given that Rohingyas have been living in the area for many, uh, many uh, generations, they should be eligible for citizenship, especially for the the other type of inferior citizenship that are reserved for immigrant populations. But many uh, Myanmar residents do not want to even give them citizenship. So according to one respondent um, who uh, said to me, quote, Despite the restrictions imposed on the movement of Rohingyas to move to the rest of the country, they have already managed to disperse in the country. Can you imagine if restrictions were lifted and if they were given citizenship? They will take over the whole country. So there were, the fears is just so widespread, right? So this is the context in which scholars who are doing research on Burma has been working. It's very uncomfortable. It's, it's put us in a very difficult situation. So I want to talk about the various responses that each of us has taken um, so far. So some scholars take a particular side, right, either in favor of the government or in favor of um, international, taking the positions, taking um, by uh, international communities in favor of uh, Rohingya. So I can give you one extreme example. There was a Myanmar-born Canadian professor who, um, who teaches in um, Canada, and she was quoted as saying, quote, Myanmar not involved in ethnic cleansing. And then she was also quoted as saying, I'm concerned uh, about rape, but stories can be made up blaming soldiers when it can be from their own men. So this is a, an extreme case of somebody who is taking a particular position, uh, seemingly uh, in defense of uh, Myanmar government uh, or Myanmar military. Other scholars, however, try to provide both sides of the positions, try to remain neutral. Uh, there are also a few uh, researchers who are working on uh, publishing and researching on uh, relevant issues. So, for instance, I have a colleague who has been um, working on the implications of the approach by international communities to rush to repatriate refugees back into the country. She highlights a lot of an adverse implications that could take place. I have a student who has been working on analyzing military campaign uh, strategy against Rohingyas uh, and comparing with the, the strategy of the military campaign against other minority groups. Another student of mine look at uh, the disunity within Rohingya armed resistance movement. Um, and Professor Matt Walter is also working on uh, trying to understand the underlying feelings expressed by uh, uh, Buddhist populations in Myanmar. Uh, and even at this conference, we have a couple of uh, papers that talk about uh, the situations of um, Rohingyas in India and the ASEAN uh, policies toward uh, Rohingya populations. And then they also use a variety of venues, uh, uh, media, public forum, academic writings, and some of them play a relatively more or less uh, quiet uh, behind the scene approach by quietly consulting uh, political uh, policy communities. Many of the scholars I have talked to, however, have done nothing um, given the situations. And I try to understand why this is the case. And they told me that they don't feel like they have enough. Again, as I have already mentioned, they don't feel like they have enough expertise or they think that taking sides is unproductive uh, given the complexity of the issues of the debates. And or some of them felt like 
uh, they would not be able to contribute anything new because these informations have been shared and made known by other people already. Other scholars, however, take a, a more activist role by pressuring, openly pressuring uh, the governments, uh, foreign governments or uh, Burma study communities to disengage with Myanmar government or started naming or shame and shaming uh, other uh, academia who has not done anything in regard to the situation. There was a scholar, um, uh, Jacques Leider, who is a famous histor historian, and um, he also came under criticism, and recently over 80 academics and activists protested against a plan by Oxford University to publish a paper about Rohingya by him, and they alleged that uh, he was biased and he had close links with the uh, Myanmar brutal military. However, I want to also add here that there are also a group of scholars who came to defend Jack Leider and felt that the academic cited here seem to have very little understanding about his work and treat him very unfairly and fail to appreciate the depth and careful analysis of his scholarships. So let me talk about implications and consequence of scholars. I have talked about the, a variety of responses that have taken by scholars on Burma. And now let's think through the implications here. So there are a variety of implications for us be, remaining quiet or uh, being uh, active. So what is the consequence of being silenced? Well, you can be accused of being kawa and uh, selfish. Um, what is the consequence of being balanced, right? Providing a, a, a two different sides of the arguments. Then you make both sides unhappy. And that has happened to me so many times. I remember uh, in 2012, I had a, um, a closed door conference, uh, presentations uh, attended by both Rohingya's elite and Rakhine Buddhist leaders. And I said that, your argument about whether Rohingyas are indigenous population or whether they are not is very unproductive because none of you are willing to compromise. So don't start with this. Start with try to identify the areas that you can agree on and then let's walk from them. And then nobody was happy about that. And they keep arguing. So one, one uh, Rohingya leader said, I want to tell you something. And I thought, oh, whoa, you know, this guy got my point. And he said, I want to tell you that Rohingyas are indigenous people in Myanmar. So that you know. So, uh, so, you know, sometimes we, we try to make balanced arguments, but we ended up making, um, both sides unhappy or sometimes our, uh, statements were taken out of the context and misinterpreted. Uh, so what about the consequence of offering one-sided views? And um, so, well, definitely it would make one side happy, right? And then, um, and it, it's according to this scenario, it's, it's, you know, better to make at least one side happy. And, and that might be, you know, that might be the way to go. But however, um, one-sided positions that are in favor of the government could generate negative uh, responses by international communities. A lot of civil society organizations um, who attended international, a lot of leaders of civil society organizations who attended um international conference said that they felt very uncomfortable and they felt like they were unable to express the feeling about the local populations because they're afraid of international backlash. They feel very outnumbered when they go out of the country and attend international conference. Um, One-sided positions in favor of Rohingya populations can raise public awareness, put pressures on the government, because we know that academic voices can be heard louder. We know where and how to make our voices heard. We know that our voices are taken seriously, uh, relatively seriously. However, I want to end this um, talk with the consequence of providing uh, the, this one-sided position. Uh, my argument here is, is that simplify and one-sided positions can complicate the position, uh, can complicate the 
uh, the situations. Descriptions and approaches that provide simplified versions of the issues can be misleading at best and dangerous at worst. So let's look at the example here. So what are the consequences of international response? And I'm not saying that they are all bad. There are positive outcomes coming out of it if you keep putting pressure on the government. And the, the, some of the developments that have been emerging are the consequence of pressure by international communities. Um, so that the, the response, pressure from international communities has led to um, cancellations of visits by military officers, stop military assistance and collaboration, a withdrawal of Aung San Suu Kyi awards and put pressure to reduce civilian uh, collaboration, foreign investment. And these are, these are a number of responses that have been taken by international communities. What are the consequences there? Well, that now make Myanmar to depend more on China and Russia. And it also severe ties with Islamic countries. Okay, so Myanmar is now very unpopular among Islamic countries. It also creates situations for potential extreme Islamic attacks on Myanmar. In addition, it also slowed down the democratic transition because now there has been rumors that the military is interested in, you know, um, uh, taking over the country either, either partially or the whole country. And the last point, the important point that I want to make is that this whole international re response bring the whole populations of Myanmar behind the military. And this is very dangerous. So they rarely public support behind the military and unify the groups uh, previously divided. So in Myanmar history, you, have, you can see a lot of divisions. The military was never popular. There has been a long history of hostility and tensions between military and the opposition group. Right, The opposition government would like to have a complete control over the government, but the military has not allowed. So there is continuing simmering tensions. The military has never been popular among its people because the military, um, because of its violations of human rights, the military has never been popular among the minority groups. And finally, there has been tensions between majority and minority uh, populations, especially among the Rakhine Buddhists. The Rakhine Buddhists are very resentful of Burma Buddhist dominations in their region, right? So there, previously, these groups were divided. And, uh, and I'm not even talking about the divisions within each group. So they were resentful of Burma domination since the Burma kings occupied the area in 17, their um, kingdom in 1785. And so if you look at the, the period of military rule, there has been a succession of armed resistance movement led by uh, Rakhai armed resistance groups against the central government dominated uh, by majority populations. And Rakhine Buddhists also resented the Myanmar government for adopting divide and rule policies. So throughout the independence period, Rohingyas were allowed to vote in the elections, even up to 2010 elections. And here, Rakhine Buddhists perceived that the Myanmar government tried to mobilize Rohingya populations to vote for their own party at the expense of the Rakhine political party. In addition to that, Rakhine Buddhists also blamed the uh, Buddhist uh, Burma civil servants, immigrant officers, uh, police and custom officers uh, as being corrupt and responsible for the inflow of immigrants into the country. And finally, Rakhine populations felt like they have a disproportionate share of Rohingya populations in their region. They would like the central government to lift the restrictions so that these populations can uh, move into the rest of the country. But currently, the central government has not allowed that. So Rakhine uh, Buddhists have felt like they have been um, disproportionately sharing the burden of these um, Rohingya issues and crisis. So what happened here? Uh, this complicated the whole situations. 
I have talked about the existing divisions and、um, because of the international response, this rarely all the populations, regardless of their religions, regardless of their ethnic origins, behind the military. This is the issue that I would say that a majority of people, as well as Myanmar. Uh, army and Myanmar government share the same position, and this is where I think is dangerous. So, Rohingya issue or Rakhine crisis is multifaceted and complex, right? So we have talked about this involve、uh, human rights violations. It also involves repatriations of resettlement. It also involves dispute over original inhabitants of the land, citizenship, communal relationships, poverty. It's it's a host of issues. And it requires short-term as well as long-term solutions. One of the、um, one of the leader for civil society organization said that Rakhine crisis involves a number of issues: human rights violations, citizenship right, indigenous issues, which is a historical issue. And he felt like international community lumps all of these issues together, right? Many people, many moderate people inside the country, accept that this is a clear human rights violations, but they were not unsure about when you talk about, you know, the indigenous,、um, the status of whether they're indigenous people, the status of citizenship. So by lumping all the issues together, they feel like international communities has complicated the issues. So in the end, the message that I want to give to Um, our、uh, graduate students, scholars, and scholars working on similar situation is that,、uh, if I have to summarize、uh, briefly in one page here,、um, we academics are well positioned to engage with the public by uh, contributing knowledge, uh, drawing comparative insights from as well, providing critical evaluations and assessment. Yes. Scholars are supposed to be non-biased and objective, but we have some degrees of predispositions towards certain values. We have some level of biasness,、uh, depending on how we are trained, where we were raised, and the social political context in which、uh, we grew up. And that's why we see a variety of responses have been taken by scholars who are studying、uh, Myanmar. Some academics see this human humanitarian crisis as a responsibility to speak out the atrocities committed by the military. A few things, and and uh, uh, quite many actually think that it is more effective to use non-confrontational strategy to bring changes quietly within the system and to work quietly on the ground and behind the scenes and address the plights of the populations. The most important here is that to acknowledge the diversity of approaches, and not to criticize approach taken by others and to condemn people who do not agree with us, but to acknowledge the merits of divisions of labor that each of us has taken. And at the very least, I strongly believe that scholars should not become a part of the problem by further fueling the conflicts by portraying only one aspect of the issue. As I have already mentioned and have、uh, demonstrated, descriptions and approaches that provide simplified versions of the issue can be misleading at best and dangerous at worst. We need to discuss the issue in a larger context. We should not come at the expense of continued focus on persistent suffering as well in the country. And finally, as Academic researchers and scholar, we need to continuously exercise self-reflections and assess the consequence of our actions and inactions, and adjust our positions depending on the evolving situations. So I'll end this here. Thank you very much.